everyone. Thank you for coming out and uh, implicitly deciding to listen to me. Um, no PowerPoint, no whizzy whiz this evening, you've just got me. So I'm going to try and do justice to this rather intriguing subject. God's word will fill the earth and as such we have an almost entirely well, we have a Christadelphian audience, people who have either been baptised or who are going through our CYCs and Sunday school. So, I, I, I take that for granted in the way I will address my words, if you will forgive me. Now, we're familiar with the picture of creation, are we not? And the culmination of creation is recorded in verses 27 and 28 of the first chapter. So, the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And there was a purpose for this creation. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, Replenish the earth, subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, every living thing that moves on the earth. And it is recorded that God saw everything that he had made and it was very good. So there we, there we understand how God made the earth and what he did with the creation, the contents of the earth. Uh, and the creation is to have dominion and it is to fill the earth, to, to be fruitful, to multiply and replenish and to have dominion over the creation that God has made. If we go a little further into, into chapter 2 and verse 15, we see that the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And there we have the idea of labour and service. Serving God's very creation to bring glory and honour to that creation. And that is the order of things that God put in place. And as such, that was the order that continued. As we know, man chose to exercise his own free will and disobey. And that resulted in a description whereby the world was entirely wicked and God sought to destroy it. And there was a flood. And yet straight after the flood, God reminds Noah in verse 1 of chapter 9, God blesses Noah and his sons and he says unto them, be fruitful, multiply and replenish the earth. And it's repeated in verse 7. And you, be fruitful, multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. So, quite <coughs> clearly, mankind was put on this earth to fill the earth and to bring glory to God's creation. And yet, by the time we get to chapter 11, mankind is once again ploughing his own independent furrow. Naturally, after the flood, there is a growth in population, and as the population grows, you can't stay in one place, you have to move out. And that was the intention that we understand with God's creation, to, to fill the earth. And yet, they have a different idea. So as they spread, in verse 2, as they journey from the east, or you could understand that, as, as they journey eastward, they come to the land of Shinar and they live there. And, and they have this idea. Go to, let's make some bricks, and, and there's an industrial process. And, and they say, let us build us a city and a tower. Okay. So first and foremost, a city wasn't necessarily what God had in mind. God had the idea that they would spread out and fill the earth, not congregate in one place. And as for this tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And we can understand that in, that in different ways. We, we could maybe understand that as a tower which was to go as tall as some of man's 
more, more um, unnecessary creations. You could go to Dubai and, and various places and cities where they're ridiculously tall and inappropriate buildings. But, but the key point is they may have been trying to reach heaven to supplant God in his position. Or at the same time we could understand that description to be something akin to a ziggurat whereby that was somewhere where they could build high above the plain and, and they could worship and dominate the land and they could worship a false god. And as we can see, that was not the intent that God had. So, that was the intent and that was the action of mankind. And the Lord comes down, notice. The, the ability to reach up to heaven with their construction hadn't got very far. The Lord has to come down. And as such, he can see what's going on. Nothing is hidden from God's eyes. And the comment is made in verse 6 of chapter 11. The people is one. They all have one language. And this they begin to do. Or the ESV says, this is only the beginning. We don't know what worse things could follow. Now, nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So here is man's own attempt, attempt, one way or another, either through idolatrous worship or just wishing to put themselves in the place of God. Whichever one it is, God needs to intervene yet again so soon after the event of the flood. Now, let's go down. Confound their language so that they may not understand or hear one another's speech. And so the Lord scatters them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. Again, to fill the earth, to multiply and replenish it. And they stop building the city, unsurprisingly. It would have been very difficult. I don't think at that stage they, they had mastered the French-English dictionary or vice versa to make it relevant to our lives today. But the byword is in verse 9. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, or confusion, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon all the face of the earth. So there we have just some starters and some simple biblical principles about the creation and, and man's purpose within that creation. And we have a very quick understanding of man's nature Man's pride, desire to be better than, to, to order his own affairs. I know what God wants, but I'll do things my way. Let's all live here and let's do this. And that is not the way that God wanted it. And he intervenes. Now, we know how things progress, and, and, and I trust you'll follow my line of thought. I want to go to the 20th chapter of Exodus now, because... Mankind does indeed populate the earth and, and there's a spread and, and we, have, we have various people from, from the area of Babel, um, the family of Abraham, move out to inherit the promised land. And then we understand that, that the tribulations of famine take the Israelites down to, down to Egypt and a different nation. And yet there is a promise and the promise to return to the, the Holy Land is pursued by Moses under God's stewardship. And as we progress on that journey, we see God's law being given to the Israelites. And that's what we record in Exodus chapter 20. And I just want to, to pause to look at a few of these, uh, the first three of these uh, commandments. The first one is, I am the Lord thy God. I am. There's no room for a ziggurat. There's no room for you to put yourself in God's stead. I am the Lord thy God. And don't forget, I've brought you out of the land of Egypt and the house of bondage. That makes me a redeemer and one who can provide salvation. As it were, the flip side to the same coin you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. So that's clear. But notice, I the Lord thy God am a jealous God. 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third, fourth generation of them that hate me, yet showing mercy to thousands that love me and keep my commandments. So there we have a very simple statement. I am the Lord your God. You are to put nothing else in my place. I am a jealous God. I will reward those who love me and obey me, and I will punish those who despise or hate me. And then, it doesn't really need saying, but in verse 7, the third, you shall not take the name of thy, the Lord thy God in vain. The Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. So here we're thinking about God's word will fill the earth. That's our subject. Why have I gone down this route? Well, we've seen that mankind meant that, well, different languages fill the earth. There was one creation and one mankind and one language. But the pride and the idolatrous nature of man have changed that situation. And from our own experiences today, blasphemy and the abuse of language is something that dominates our society. We're well acquainted with the, the discussion of blasphemy in relation to us, Islam and the, the Muslim faith, and yet somehow or other we, we tend to totally ignore the, the impact of blasphemy which offends the very core of our belief. So when we, we come as Christadelphians to this subject, we cannot wait for God's word to fill this earth. We know that God is a jealous God. He desires worship and praise. And there are commands that expect us to demonstrate that. Not to demean and to remove the power from the position and the status of the Lord our God. So thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And God gives them, the children of Israel, a structure. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, whereby the Israelites can easily follow this path, this life which is laid out within the commandments, a life devoted to the worship of the Lord God who created and redeemed. We're going to, look, to pick up at, at verse 4, um, verse 5. Behold, I, I've taught you this stuff, a, a load of statutes and judgments, e even as the Lord my God commanded me, these are the words of Moses, so that you should do so in the land where you go to possess. So I'm telling you this, not, not just for some sort of righteous sort of feeling that I have, but it's so that you can do God's will when you inherit the land, the promised land. So, verse 6, keep and do. This is your wisdom and your understanding. So from the word of God will come knowledge, wisdom and understanding. And that will be evident to the nations around you in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and they shall say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So the instruction, and if the Israelites had obeyed, was that they would be a flagship, uh, something which would give wisdom and understanding to those who observed. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them? As the Lord our God is in all these things that we call upon him for. And then there's admiration in verse 8 for the statutes and the judgments, the righteousness of God's law. But then we have the word of warning in verse 9. Take heed to yourself and keep thy soul diligently, lest you forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them, thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that you stood before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, 
Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. So there's this nice order which the Lord God creates for the Israelites, his chosen and special and peculiar people. And that is so that the word of God is at the very heart of their society, that it would enable them to shine as a light amongst the godless nations around, and that those nations may come to an understanding and an awareness of the Lord God, of his wisdom and of his righteous law, which sets them apart from the laws of man and the society that surrounds us today. But it is not easily done. And that's the challenge we face. Take heed, look at your own position. Keep yourself diligent. Don't forget, because as soon as you are lacking in diligence, you'll go wandering. You, you will forget, you will depart. But to keep you on that line, just make sure you teach your children and your children's children. And that way, the rigour and, and, and the diligence which God expects in our lives is naturally a part of our society. So there is the instruction. And we understand that because God has set out that he is a jealous God. He, he is a God who desires the praise and the glory that is coming to him. Now, I, I could continue and we could look all the way through the Judges and Joshua and Kings and Chronicles, but I want to take you to the Psalmist now. I want you to, to, to just look at a few Psalms, and I'm trying to take this, this little um, talk this evening quite literally so that we just keep turning from left to right. It, it, it's not as simple as that, but we will endeavour that that's the easiest way. So. Psalm 5, give ear to my words, O Lord, and consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. So the psalmist is demanding God's, God's attention. And what does he do to support that, that request to be heard? My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. So the very first thing in the day is that our, our words should be directed to the Lord God. In the morning will I direct my prayer to thee. And then verse 5. The foolish shan't stand in thy sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. You shall destroy them that speak leasing, or lies. So, so God will destroy liars. The Lord will abhor the bloody, or the man of blood, and the deceitful man. So, words. Words which aren't what they seem. And, and here we have the first inkling as to the real nature of mankind. So, so there are straightforward falsehoods. Where, where, where you deny that black is white. Uh, and, and that's a fairly straightforward position. Not an admirable position. And yet you have deceit. Where words are said and something else is intended or done. And here we come to the very heart of mankind. So the, Lord, the prayer that the psalmist throws to the Lord is... Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness, verse 8, because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. So we have some good guidance here. Let's start our day. Let's make the resolution as the psalmist that the very first thing we do will be to call unto God. We know that God doesn't like liars. God does not like deceit. And we need to pray. We need to pray for God to direct our lives in righteousness. Let's go on to Psalm 10 now. And, and, and just continue the same idea. Verse 
first three. The wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous man whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, won't seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above and out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffs at them. He has said in his heart, I shall be moved. I, I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing, deceit, fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. So we have a, a little more understanding of what we're doing in our lives as the psalmist expresses it as he understands it. The way of man, and we've got that word there, pride. Mankind naturally puts himself above others. And if you do that, then you are making God smaller a smaller part in your life. And as we've just seen, as soon as that happens, well then we forget and we depart from the way of the Lord. And just as if we need the examples, the cursing, the deceit, the fraud, the mischief and the vanity, those are things that we need to be very careful of. When we look at the subject and say God's word will fill the earth, what do we see in the world around us? Now, those of you who know me know I like a little bit of sport. And last week, uh, the shenanigans in Switzerland and what's purportedly the governing body of the world's football associations was just about everything you could see in verse 7 in pretty much the same storyline that dominated, dominated the world because these... These nations that belong to FIFA are more and numerous than those that belong to the UN. And there is no surprise there because people want money. And the covetousness, the desire, the boasting, the pride. And it is everything that we hate in, in, in the world around us. Why we should desire the world that God has promised. Now, go on to Psalm 15. We have the opposite to that. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle or in thy house? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? So there's the question. Here's the answer. He that walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth. Not just audibly, the way he conducts his affairs, but in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue nor doeth evil to his neighbour, nor takes up a reproach against his neighbour, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honours them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and change not. He that puts not out his money to usury, nor takes reward against the innocent. It's he that doeth these things shall never be moved. And yet we had the picture in Psalm 10 of the the, the worldly, ungodly man who in his vanity says, I'm, I'm not going to be moved, I'm, I'm strong in my own right. Our strength comes from the Lord God. And again, the negative signs. He that backbites. How often do we say something in the speed or the heat of the moment and wish you could take the word back? They're gone. The word is done and the hurt is assumed before we've even thought about it. And so you have the idea of a reproach and your behaviour goes down those lines, those ungodly ways. So Psalm 34 now for our little dalliance within the Psalms and then we shall move on to, to the minor prophets which, uh, which challenge us maybe. So Psalm 34. Verse 11, come ye children, hearken unto me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And that's the principle that we saw in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, that we teach our children and our children's children. We keep the word of God at the very heart of our community. 
what manner is what man is he that desires life loves many days so that he can see good well keep your tongue from evil your lips from speaking guile depart from evil do good seek peace pursue it the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry so the word of the Lord is to dictate our behavior if we go and learn from the Lord God then we will learn respect we want to be rewarded with verse 12 life many days that we can see good and that's the promise that God has in his grace eternal life but if we want that then we have to refrain from speaking evil our lips from speaking guile deceit and deceitfully using using shapes smoke and mirrors is a phrase that's used to give the appearance of something we're to leave evil aside and we're to seek peace the peace that God can bring in our lives and then we turn to the Lord our God verse 17 the righteous cry the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles so if we can fill the world the world with the word of God then the world will be a much better place so that's the the understanding we build we understand the way of mankind and we understand the requirement that God wants of us and yet at the same time we become well aware of human nature and our own inability to live up to the standards and I've alluded there to, to the, the, the speed of the tongue as opposed to that of the body or the mind and how sometimes we find ourselves saying things that we would rather not have done with hindsight now let's go to Amos please and here we have the words of a prophet about the house of Israel and this is a lamentation verse 1 of Amos chapter 5 against the house of Israel Verse 6 of this fifth chapter of Amos. Seek the Lord and ye shall live. Lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it and there be none to quench it in Bethel. Ye who turn judgment to wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth. So that's the position that the Israelites face. They they can turn to God and live otherwise there is a fire that will break out that will destroy and yet the house of Israel are termed as people who who use judgment in a rotten way and and they leave off righteousness so they have steered their lives away from the Lord God and then verse 8 seek him that made the stars that made the Creator Verse 10, they hate him that rebukes in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. So the nation of Israel have turned, and they no longer like the righteous judgment in the gate of the city. They, they despise the righteous conversation of the godly. And if we just move on, verse 13. Well, verse 12, I know your manifold transgressions, your mighty sins. They afflict the just, they take a bribe, they turn aside the poor in the gate. And that's mindful of somebody who, who, who is desirous of their own position, their own wealth, rather than the well-being of the nation, the special people God had chosen. Therefore, the prudent... Well, they shall keep silence in that time because it is an evil time. So the guidance to the Israelites is for those who are godly is to, to hold their peace because it is evil and evil around them. So that's verse 13. 
Verse 18, and here's a warning and a phrase that we will see again in a few minutes. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness, it's not light. Verse 20, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feast days, I will not smell in your your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and meat offerings, I won't accept them, neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat breasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs. I will not hear the melody of your vials. So here's a picture, a picture about people who profess to love the day of the Lord. And we understand the day of the Lord as the day of the Lord's return. The day when the Lord will change the order of the world as we know it and establish his kingdom. And yet the Israelites, we have seen that they don't like godly, righteous judgment. That the prudent, the godly, are having to stay silent because of the evil times. And yet the Israelites at, at, at large are actually, on the face of things, desiring the day of the Lord. They are still, verse 21 following the feasts they are still offering and worshipping God but the Lord says I will not hear that worship so those words are vain words words of vanity and deceit so when we understand that we need to speak to God in our hearts we need to look within ourselves and we need to make sure that our hearts are determined and our actions and our thoughts are determined by the law of God. It's not just to be seen to be doing and saying. It's our actions and the way we order our lives. As John the Baptist told the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they need to bring forth fruits of repentance. And so... That was the position within the nation of Israel. And God despised that situation. Let's go on to Micah and chapter 5. Chapter 4. No, chapter 6 actually. But you can keep your finger in Micah because we'll come back to it in a few minutes, God willing. So, Micah and chapter 6. This just adds weight to the position of the prophet Amos. Verse 9. The Lord's voice cries unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? Are, ye, are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked, and the scant measure that's abominable? Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and the bag of deceitful weights? The rich men thereof are full of violence. The inhabitants have spoken lies. Their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee, in making thee desolate because of thy sins. And again, the desire is, verse 8, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to do justly. To love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. And yet they were doing the opposite of that. They were unjust. They weren't showing mercy. And they were, they were elevating themselves within their own society. And they were doing that using the deceit, the vanity and the qualities that God does not want insincere in their protestation of faith and as such God will not accept that so now let's go on to James and chapter 2 we jump into the New Testament for a couple of references we know that the letter of James talks about the power of the tongue and if we're thinking about how we order our lives and 
the word of God, what does James say? Verse 5 of chapter 2. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hasn't God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him? Well, that's the position. But you, you have despised the poor. You've dishonoured, you've insulted the poor. Don't rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Again, looking after themselves and not showing mercy. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? And here we have the state of play. The fraud, the vanity, the deceit and the blasphemy. That which is legislated for within God's law. That which shouldn't be a part of the society. Simple comment, verse 8. If you fulfil the royal law according to the scripture, so if you do what you've been taught and what you are teaching your children, then you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Well, if you can do that, well, then you do well. But if you've got respect to persons, well, then you commit sin and are convicted or convinced of the law as transgressors. Okay? So, James makes a very straightforward point, and it gets to the quick of where we are. Do we love the Lord our God with all our soul, and with all our heart, or do we love ourselves? That's really the question that is being asked. So, let's have a look at chapter 3. There's some guidance here as to language. My chapter is entitled Control the Tongue and we have some some good guidance here. My brethren, be not many masters knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation for in many things we offend everyone. If anyone offends not in word, well he's a perfect man and he's able to control or bridle the whole body. And then we have some pictures. You, you put a bit in a horse's mouth so that you can direct it. You put a rudder on a ship so that you can steer it. Even so, verse 5, the tongue is a little member, and yet it boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. So James is drawing together some of the language that we've just read in the Old Testament. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. It is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, of birds, of serpents, and things in the sea is tamed, and has been tamed of mankind. Yet the tongue can no one tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. So, there is the challenge set out before us. We, we are wonderfully gifted with the knowledge of God. And yet, we have to demonstrate wonderful self-control in how we exercise the gift that God has given us. Now, let's go to 2 Peter and chapter 2. So this is talking about false teachings in, in, in the early church. There were, there were false prophets also among the people, as there will be false teachers among you. So, so the warning is that there are things that, if you're a teacher, you exercise authority and have a message. But if you're a false teacher, your message is perverted and, and, and wrong, false. There shall be false teachers among you who privily should bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And that word there is the word that is translated, shall be even spoken of, is, is the same as blasphemed. Okay, So it will deny the power of God and his authority in this world. 
So beware the way of the world. It will corrupt God's will and God's word and God's command. And that message is so strong that he, he repeats it further down the chapter. So we have this instruction, verse 9. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So don't forget what God said when the law was given to the Israelites. I'm a jealous God. I will reward and I can condemn. So don't forget that, that God has that position. But chiefly, verse 10, them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They're not afraid to blaspheme or to speak evil of dignities, as it is translated in the AV. But that's the same word as, as, as you've picked out, or I picked out in verse 2. So, so Peter's message to, to the New Testament believers is quite strong. Be careful. Be very wary of how you, you, you listen and react to the, the teaching of the, the gospel. There will be those who try to pervert and, and to pretend that things are another way. And there will be condemnation to those who choose to deny God's power and God's teaching. So you have to be very, very careful. And so with that thought in mind, we go to 2 Timothy in chapter 3. Because here we have that phrase, the last days, that we saw in the Minor Prophets. So, verse 1 of 2 Timothy 3, and this is a reference that is used on this platform many times. Know this also, that in the last days there will be dangerous times, perilous times shall come. And this describes the world around us. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, there's that word from 2 Peter 2, Obedient to uh, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, so they break promises, false accusers, telling lies, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, they betray their words, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. So that's the way of the world. But beware, having a form of godliness, just as you saw in the prophecy of Amos and Micah. They were going through the mode of worship and praise, and yet they deny the power thereof. The definition of blasphemy, denying God's power and God's position. From such, turn away. And then you have the instruction, verse 10, but thou has fully known my doctrine, the commandments, the statutes, the law of God, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, and then what he's had to endure. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. And then he instructs him, continue, verse 14, thou in the things which you have learned and been assured of. So continue in this way. So, verse 17, the man of God may be perfect, mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, if we adhere to the word of God, if we make it central to our lives, as we can see in the day of the Lord, the way of the world around us, where, where man's word is worthless, it is selfish, vain and deceitful. It pretends to be godly, and yet at its very heart it is ungodly. Well, we just need to make sure we can t continue to centre our lives on the Word of God. And so, we go to Micah chapter 4, my penultimate reference. I told you we'd go there, so hopefully you've got a little bookmark. And we have this phrase again, in the last days. And here we have a prophecy of God's kingdom to come. In the last days, in, in Micah chapter 4 and the first verse, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established in the top of the mountains. It shall be exalted above the hills and people will go to it. They shall flow unto it. 
nations shall come and they'll say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths. The law will go out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. What a wonderful picture. He shall judge, verse 3. He shall rebuke. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. So there will be a change in the way the nations work. Peace will reign instead of warfare. But verse 4, they shall sit, everyone, under his own vine or his fig tree. No one shall make them afraid because the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. All people will walk, everyone in the name of his God, will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So there's a picture here where everyone turns to the Lord God to benefit from his word, his teaching and his instruction. And they will return to their place and they will abide by the word of God. And that's something that the, the Lord of hosts has spoken it. He's promised that this will come. So there's an instruction there and a picture we could pick up other references, but I want one little last passage in Matthew chapter 15, which is a chapter or, or a passage from Jesus, which, which gives us some, some warning and some guidance. I'm going to pick up in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8, because we have a choice before us now. We have a picture that dis describes a time when the word of God will fill the earth. That is God's promise. And he says the Lord has spoken it. We can be certain in that promise. It is not a promise of man. And yet we've got the example of the Israelites. Who, who pretended to worship and were quite keen to look after themselves. With their false weights and so on and so forth. We've got the teaching of Peter in his second letter where he says... People will come, they'll be false teachers. They will pretend to have the word of God. What does Jesus say? Verse 8. This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honour, honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So, so that's the instruction, that's the position, and we're familiar with that. And then he says... Verse 10, hear and understand, not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. And that's something that the, the disciples, the audience, um, struggle to understand. And the disciples, verse 12, come and say, don't you realise you're causing the Pharisees some offence? And he has to explain. Verse 16, Peter says, declare unto us, or verse 15, declare unto us this parable. So, are ye also yet without understanding? Do you get it? Are you getting me? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in into the mouth goes into the belly and is kissed, cast out into the draught? Those things which proceed out of the mouth, well, they just come straight from the heart. And it's that which defiles the man. And out of the heart proceeds... This list of things that God doesn't like. Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemy. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands, well, that's completely irrelevant, really. So as we go away from this place, we can be assured of God's promise. God's promise that he will bring his own order. As we understand in the teaching of the Lord's Prayer, that God's will shall be done on this earth. We understand that we have an option as to how we order our lives, as to whether we can play a part when God fulfills his promise. But we're given some very good advice that if the, the law of God is in our hearts, well then that will make sure that our thoughts, our actions and our words are centred on the Lord of God rather than on the, the false desires of the world. Thank you.